The WTUL faced no easy task in its efforts to support women's unionization. For years, organized men had simply not taken women seriously as workers, much less as trade union members. Active hostility created uneasy alliances, even when women organized themselves, as the printers, the collar makers, and the boot and shoe makers had done. But the early 20th century witnessed such desperate need on the part of women and such promising energy on the part of male unionists that the time seemed ripe for another effort. When Rose Schneiderman organized several dozen female cap makers in the early 1900s, she turned to the Cap Makers Union, then affiliated with the United Hebrew Trades and the American Federation of Labor to take them in. They refused. Luckily, though, somewhat reluctantly, the newly formed International Ladies Garment Workers Union agreed to admit the small local. But then they gave Schneiderman neither power nor authority. When she turned to the Women's Trade Union League, however, she got some help. Women like Ava Belmont, a socialite, Margaret Dreyer Robbins, an upper-middle-class reformer, and Anne Morgan, yes, she was the daughter of the J.P. Morgan we know so well, all these women offered to help. They provided organizing funds and offered Schneiderman a job as an organizer if she would take it. She did. But even with the help of the WTUL, Schneiderman and her union friends could make very little progress within the ILGWU. By 1909, they were fed up. They were angry at having to provide their own thread and needles, furious at the idiosyncratic array of fines they were forced to pay, tired out by the 65-hour work weeks that could extend even longer during rush season. The men had gone out on strike in 1907 and had won some very small victories. But they'd refused to include women dressmakers or women in the growing shirtwaist industry in their strike. By 1909, the women were angry. The shirtwaist makers decided on their own and with the help of the Women's Trade Union League, which printed flyers for them, to call a meeting about their conditions in the trade. And one evening in November of 1909, they met at Cooper Union without the authorization of the United Hebrew Trades and the International Ladies Garment Workers. The leaders of these unions nevertheless showed up at the meeting and took over the platform. After hours of discussion at which the women complained about the conditions and asked for a strike, and the men grumbled that the women would never be able to maintain and sustain a lengthy strike, 16-year-old Clara Lemlick demanded the floor. In an episode that is now legendary, she declared, we have suffered enough. It is time to strike. And then raising her right arm, she uttered the oath that the men had sworn two years before. If I betray the oath I now make, may this hand shrivel from the arm I now raise. Some historians say 30,000 women went out on strike in response. Probably the number is closer to 20,000. But whatever it was, thousands of women shut down the garment industry in New York. The women asked for set prices that would lead to higher wages for peace work. They demanded an end to favoritism in the distribution of jobs. They sought an end as well to sexual harassment in the workplace whereby those workers who were willing to grant sexual favors got the best paying work, the easiest work, the most work. But above all, the women wanted union recognition. For three months, November, December, January, and into February, 
the women remained out on strike. They set up picket lines in the cold weather. They were beaten by thugs hired by the manufacturers. Police accused picketers of prostitution and threw them into jail. Bail came from the Allies. The sufferings of the wage-earning women did not move the public to sympathy. The strike's turning point came only when the police made a mistake and arrested Alva Belmont along with Anne Morgan, two socialites, for prostitution. These two rather distinguished women led the public suddenly to pay attention to the strikers. Belmont and Morgan spoke at a series of public meetings along with some of the striking young women. They and other allies raised money to support families who depended on striking wage earners. Month after month, the women stayed out on strike. ILGW officers were moved, impressed. Slowly, some of the shops settled. By mid-February, however, three months into the strike, it was clear that the strike could have only mixed success. Hungry, some of them starving, aware of dependent families, the women slowly drifted back to work. The strike had mixed success. About a third of the shops recognized the International Ladies Garment Workers Union and agreed to negotiate with Local 22, the shirtwaist makers local of the union. The rest refused to recognize the union. Yet union leaders demonstrated new respect for the untrained girls, that was their slogan for them, who stayed on strike for so many months. From this point on, they committed funds and trained organizers to increase female membership. A year later, the men conducted a second strike, this time in cooperation with women members. This time, the ILG was successful.